The hardest part about becoming a freelancer is finding your first few clients. You spent a time learning the skills and building your own portfolio, but now you need to find people who are willing to pay you for that work. The search for those first few clients is really confusing because there is no defined path to follow. You really just have to try a lot of different things and then eventually you'll get that first client. I know at this stage I felt really disheartened. A couple of times I thought I should just give up and get a normal job. But eventually I figured out how to get my first few clients and from there everything became a lot easier. In this video I'm going to share with you everything I would try if I was looking to land my first clients today. I'm also going to go over what worked for me and what didn't work and how I would approach that if I was starting again. But before we get into the strategies, I want to talk about how the freelance business model works. Now, the freelance business model works a lot like a flywheel. The flywheel is hard to get moving in the beginning, but once it gets moving, once you've built some momentum, it's really hard to stop. And freelancing works a lot like this. Finding your first few clients is gonna be tricky. It's gonna be difficult because you don't have work to show people and you don't have referrals from other people. But once you actually start to get those first few clients, it becomes a lot easier. Freelancing is really all about momentum. So remember that once you get that first client, it's gonna be much easier to get the second client. And once you get the second client, it's easier to get the third client. And finally, before we get into the strategies, I just wanna give some context to my situation when I was looking for my first freelance clients. So when I first started out as a freelancer, I was 18 and I'd recently quit college to go all in on building a business online. So at the time I was following advice from different blogs and pretty much anywhere I could get any advice from. I'd learned the skills after a couple of months and I'd built myself a portfolio, but I really had no idea how to find those first few clients. The typical advice was to email your network and do things like go to networking events. But at 18, if I emailed my network, that would just be other 18 year olds who are still in college. So that didn't really apply to me. So I had to try a lot of different strategies. Most of them failed, some of them worked quite well, and some of them I continued doing after I found those first few clients, and they've been kind of lucrative ways for me to find clients since. So let's get into how I would go about finding your first freelance clients. So the first and probably the most obvious way to do this is to network. Everyone says to build your network and it's probably the most obvious advice to give any freelancer because all successful freelancers are getting work from their network. They're typically good at what they do. They know people who are willing to give them work and who want to work with them. And that is kind of the formula for any successful freelancer. But looking for tangible ways to build your network is pretty difficult. For me, in the beginning, I tried to go to a lot of in-person networking events. And this is something that I would recommend, but in my personal situation, it didn't really bring me much luck. When I was freelancing, I was living in a rural town and a lot of the people at these networking events were just running small businesses. Something that these networking events did teach me, and I am thankful that I went to them for this, is that I didn't really want to work with small businesses because if I worked with small local businesses, then I would have to work on lower budget projects and then also work on a lot more projects. So while in-person networking events didn't work for me, if you live in a city or somewhere that has larger businesses, maybe startups or the type of business that you actually want to work with, then I'd recommend going to in-person networking events. The only thing that made me hesitant about the networking events, and I, I'm not sure if this is just like a general thing, is it felt very transactional. It didn't necessarily feel like I was building long-term relationships with people. It kind of more felt like you, you went there and then people just kind of chucked business cards at you. Anyway, I would definitely recommend networking events, especially if you do not have any contacts in the beginning. The other thing with networking is just to email everyone that you, you know. I know that I said beforehand that emailing other 18 year olds who don't have businesses is not gonna do much, but if you have past employers, then email them, see if they need your services, see if they need a website, if, it's, if you're a web designer. Email literally anyone you know. Is it a family friend or, you know, just pe let people know exactly what it is that you do. The other piece of networking advice that I have is just to post what you're doing on social media. I'll go more into depth on how to use social media later in the video, but really all you need to do when you're networking is just let people know what it is that you do. If you let more and more people know what it is that you do, then the likelihood that they might refer someone to you is a lot higher. 
I don't really think that transactional networking is going to work that well in the beginning, but networking overall and building relationships with people is the best way to get work in the long term. The second strategy is cold pitching. Now, I'm a huge fan of cold pitching, and I think being good at sending cold pitches is an art form. In the beginning, I was pretty horrendous at it. I used to send people really long emails that they'd never reply to, and I'd spend so much time crafting that email, and I didn't really understand the dynamics of cold pitching and how to actually make it work. When you cold pitch someone on a freelance service, the thing you need to remember is that your service is likely a high ticket item. Now, what this means is that the sales cycle for your service is likely quite long. If you pitch someone today on a 10 grand website, the chances that they just wire across 10 grand in a couple days is very slim. Paying for freelance services is very rarely an impulse purchase. So really when you're cold pitching a freelance service, all you're trying to do is increase your awareness. So if you cold pitch a business on a website, the chances are that you just need to let them know that you make websites so that when they need a website, you're top of mind. The best framework I found to get better at cold pitching breaks it down into three main parts. And the first part is awareness, the second part is trust, and the third part is a cue. So the first part is really the cold pitch. So that is them becoming aware of what you do and who you are. So the cold pitch, really all you need to do is let the person know exactly who you are, what you do, and how you could help them in future. The second part is trust. So that is them trusting that you're good at what you do. So that comes through seeing you on social media, that comes through seeing your portfolio, or even talking to people who've already worked with you before. At this point, you can benefit from this idea called the mere exposure effect. And all that is, is that people tend to prefer things that they see often. So if you just see someone more often, the chances are that you'll think of them preferably. And the third part is a cue. So that is a reason for them to reach out to you. So if they're aware of what you do and they trust that you're good at what you do, then as soon as they have a cue, they're going to reach out to you. That cue could be them needing a website or it could be someone they're talking to needing a website. But really that sales cycle breaks down into those three parts. They need to know who you are, trust you, and then have a cue to message you and work with you. And this process might take months or even years to really kick in. So it's just important that you consistently do this. And over time, you'll start to get leads just come in just for the fact that people know who you are and they trust that you're good at what you do. The perfect example of using this framework is Dan Go. He messaged me on Twitter maybe about half a year ago, and he said, hey Stephen, I'm looking for entrepreneurs who want to lose weight and gain shape. Would you know anyone? Question mark. Now, this is the perfect way to open a cold pitch. What he has done there is he's built awareness and then he's building trust through his Twitter account. He has a decent social following and posts consistently. Now, if I ever have a queue, the chances are I'm probably gonna think about referring someone to him or if, if I wanted to do that, then I will likely go to Dan. Now, imagine that Dan just sends that to 10 people per day. Let's say that 50% of those people reply. Over the course of a month, he's now gonna have over 150 people likely to refer other people to him for freelance work. I'd apply this exact same strategy to freelance web design and Webflow development just by messaging CMOs and CTOs and founders of companies and just letting them know that you build Webflow websites and just ask if they need any help or ask if they know anyone who needs help. Just getting on their radar is gonna be the perfect way to bring in leads over time. The third strategy that I would use to find my first freelance clients would be to use freelancing platforms. So typically these freelance platforms like Upwork and Fiverr get a bad rep. And to be honest, they probably should because most of the time they're a race to the bottom. But if you actually use them correctly, you can find good clients through them. Upwork is actually where I found my first few clients. In the beginning, I had a strategy for how I wanted to use the platform. So what I did is I accepted some low paying jobs and really they were everything people warn you about Upwork and Fiverr. They were low paid and they were demanding clients. But I was okay with this in the beginning because I knew I needed to build my portfolio and I also wanted to get some good reviews on Upwork. Once I had maybe five to 10 good reviews on my profile, I decided that I would then change my profile completely and position myself as an expert and completely raise my price to where I actually wanted it to be. Once I did that, I knew there'd be fewer jobs for me to apply for because there isn't that many high ticket jobs on um, Upwork. But once I did that, I was able to spend a lot more time 
crafting kind of the perfect pitch to those high paying jobs. This actually works surprisingly well. I managed to land a lot of these jobs by just doing things like recording Loom videos as responses to their, their project. And then also just putting in a little bit of extra effort, maybe even just mocking up some initial outlines for my vision for that project. Once I landed a few of these high ticket projects, I realized that the clients were actually a lot less demanding than those low paying clients. Over time, I slowly moved them off platform and just worked with them directly, which you're not technically meant to do and I hope is not liable. But that is kind of what I did because I've started to build long-term relationships with them. A lot of those people that I actually initially found from Upwork, I still work with today. And over time, I stopped working on Upwork because it wasn't really worth my time when I was getting referrals from these other clients. But using Upwork in this way, I don't know if it still works, but it was kind of perfect for me when getting started out. If used effectively, these platforms can actually be a great place to start out. I wouldn't recommend staying on them forever because they take a big fee and most of the time it is a race to the bottom. People are looking for the cheapest freelancer they possibly can find. Really, your freelance business is going to be built on referrals and building out your network. But in the beginning, you can find some good clients on these platforms or you can even just get some experience. I know sometimes these projects aren't the greatest, but actually learning from having bad clients and bad projects helps you improve in the future and know exactly what you want in the future. Now, the fourth strategy that I would follow is to use social media. In the beginning, I really didn't use social media very much, which doesn't make any sense because like it was kind of the perfect place to market a, an online business and like a freelance business. If I was to go back now and start again, I would do two things on social media and these two things work incredibly well. The first is just post consistently on a couple of social media platforms. Now you don't need to be across every single platform. Just choose a couple that you like, but also work for your freelance business. So let's say you're a graphic designer. If you're a graphic designer, then something more visual is likely to be the best place for you to be. If you're a writer, something like Twitter might be the best place or maybe even LinkedIn, but just kind of find the balance between the social media platform that you actually like to spend your time on and, and like the people on the platform and then all also what works with your business. And all you really need to do on the platform is to just share your work and share what you're doing. People will take an interest over time and eventually you'll start to get some leads and some referrals through social media and just the network that you actually build on there. The thing that I would make sure I really don't do and I see so many people make this mistake is to use social media and only talk about their business and how great their business is. Because at the end of the day, no one really cares about your business. They care about other people and they're interested in other people. If you only talk about your business, no one's gonna interact with your stuff and the chances are that no leads are really gonna come in. What you need to do is focus on being yourself and being that personality. And you know, your business is just part of your personality. It's not just your business, it's you and the business is part of what you do. The second thing that I would try on social media is this thing called squatter marketing. Now, the first time I ever heard of squatter marketing was from Henry Belcaster and Dylan Jarden. They've used this method to build their media agency Smart Nonsense from nothing to over a million dollars in revenue in less than a year. And in that time, they've worked with people like Naval, Will Smith, and My First Million. Squatter marketing is incredibly simple, but also really effective. It kind of plays on the dynamic that you make something so good that it makes it almost impossible for the other party to not work with you. For Dylan and Henry, they assembled a team of video editors. Now these video editors created these short clips for podcasts. So I think initially this started with My First Million. They created these really cool animated clips and they got loads of attention on Twitter. It became almost impossible for Sam Parr and Shampuri to ignore these clips, so much so that they ended up having to work with them because they just couldn't not have these clips. They then did this with the All In podcast and Naval, and some of these people they worked with and some of these people they just did them for free. But really what this does is it's a perfect marketing opportunity for Smart Nonsense because these podcasts wanted to share these clips because they were so damn good, but it's also the perfect opportunity to work with these companies because you're creating something so good that they can't ignore you. With a little bit of creativity, this can be utilized in almost any freelance service, and it makes it almost impossible for these companies to say no, as you'll see in the next example. 
And that strategy is using job boards and open calls. Using job boards and replying to open calls is a great strategy because you know that that company is looking for someone with your skills. But the problem is it's very easy to get lost inside a spreadsheet. If you're just filling out a type form or just a form on a website, the chances are people are gonna look over you. The way around this is to make it impossible not to stand out. You never just want to be a row inside a spreadsheet. You want to do something that makes it very hard for the person not to hire you. This is something that I did last year after seeing Henry and Dylan employ the same strategy for My First Million. I noticed that Matt Diavella was hiring for a bunch of different positions. None of those positions matched my skills exactly, but I knew that I could offer some value to him. I had an idea to help his company slow growth set up a newsletter. This newsletter would provide value to the community, but it would also help the company actually have a direct line of communication with the potential customers. This in future would then let them pitch their courses and give them updates. At the time, I knew a decent amount about newsletters because I'd been running my own newsletter for nearly a year and I'd been setting up email automations and email marketing services for clients for the past couple of years. So to set myself apart and not just be another name inside the spreadsheet, I did three things. My thought process was that Matt creates videos, so what I would do is kind of slightly mock his style, but also communicate in the medium that he knows best. Looking back, this video is incredibly bad and very cringy. To be honest, it was quite effective. The second thing I did was create a strategy document. This was really just me brainstorming all the ideas I had for slow growth and the different things that we could do when working together. Because I wasn't applying for a specific role, I was kind of just trying to create my own role to work in a freelance capacity. I just thought, let's just give them the best ideas I possibly have and see if any of these land. And the third thing I did to help myself stand out was to create a place where Matt could go and actually see all of this stuff together rather than having to try see it in an email or, or get this across to him in a spreadsheet. So what I did was use what I know best and create a website. This website was called hiremematt.com and it just included the whole pitch and a few jokes in there. Finally, I tweeted this and went to go do some work, not really expecting too much. Once I came back to my email, I noticed that the site had a submission. Name, Matt Diavella. Message, wow, I'm blown away. This is crazy, lol, let's talk. From there we set up a call, got connected, and eventually launched the Snail Mail newsletter with his team and a great writer. The thing to take from this isn't that what I did was particularly special or even very good. The video, looking back, was completely horrendous. It was just so bad. The website that I made was just from a template because I wanted to do it quickly. And really the strategy document was just me kind of doing a brain dump onto a page and, and seeing what I would do if I was in his position. The reason this worked is just because I put in a bit more effort than most people. If you really want a position, if you really want this freelance job, freelance opportunity, then what you need to do is make sure that you're not just another name in a spreadsheet or just another person in the LinkedIn inbox. You need to do something that actually sets you apart. And once you do that thing that sets you apart, once you actually put in a little bit more effort, people will reward that. Finding your first few freelance clients is always gonna be the hardest part of freelancing. Once you've actually found those, everything else is gonna become a lot easier. As I mentioned earlier in the video, finding your second client is a lot easier than finding your first, and finding your third is a lot easier than finding your second. Once you've landed those initial projects and you've provided great work for the client, the chances are that you're gonna get referrals and you're gonna start to build up your network. Over time, you won't have to follow all of these different strategies and use platforms and things like that because ultimately what will happen is people will start referring you and you'll start getting inbound leads from putting content on social media and things like that. If you have any other strategies that you found useful for finding your first freelance clients, then be sure to drop them in the comments because I'd love to see them and I'm sure people will find them useful. If you found this video useful, then make sure to subscribe because I have more videos coming soon on topics like freelancing, self-development, and entrepreneurship. Thank you very much for watching, and I will see you in the next one.